Hello everybody, I'm Joey Smokey and this is the Supplemental Instruction Series of Videos for Chemistry 121. This episode I'm going to be talking about energy diagrams. Energy diagrams? Yes, energy diagrams. How's it going, Kevin? Not bad. My name is Kevin Martin. I'm going to be talking about energy diagrams. Yes, that should be obvious by now. Now, so, what is all this hieroglyphic stuff? Well, that's a good question. So this the whole picture here is what we call an energy diagram. So that's what it is. Yes, that's okay. what this is. It does look like hieroglyphic stuff, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So when you think about it, when you deal with a chemical reaction, you know how you have like beakers of stuff and you put them together and it reacts and things go boom and you know, you make new products and things change and all that. I like it when things go boom. Yes, it is very cool. TNT? Yes. It's not dynamite. <laughs> that's right. So what's happening is a whole bunch of different changes in energy. Changes in energy, you say? Yes. So we do these things called energy diagrams to represent those changes of energy in the chemical reaction. So, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. I have everything all labeled and all that for you already. Basically, what we have here is increasing energy and the reaction progress. So okay? the time of the reaction, in other words? Basically, yes. So okay. when you start with the reactants, which are right here, you know, you put them in a beaker and you let them go. So this represents the energy level of the reactants. That's mind. right. Okay. Good point. That's a very good point. This is basically, and it's all relative, it isn't like exact or anything. This is relatively where the reactants are going to start <coughs> energy-wise. Okay. Know, kind of middle, low down here, somewhere like that. Okay? So when we put them together, um, they're going to you know, start reacting and having transfers of energy. But sometimes what happens is that you have to input energy, or in other words, it's going to take more energy to get those reactants to actually transfer and turn into new things. You can kind of see that represented by this hump right here of increasing energy in order to reach the transition state. This transition state is basically where your reactants are going through you know, different weird things going on in order to turn into your final products. Down the line, under their activation energy. Right. Exactly what does that mean? That, rep, that tells you activation energy is how much energy it takes to get over that hump and reach the transition state. So that's the energy we're talking about that it needs to take. Exactly. Okay. Right. And depending on your reaction, it might have a whole <coughs> bunch of, of activation energy, it might have a little tiny activation energy. It all depends on what you're dealing with. So that's what the reactants are, they go up the hump, you know, the activation energy it takes to reach the transition state. Once they reach the transition state, you can see there's a pretty sharp down, downfall, you know, down the hill towards the products, which, you know, products are the end it's of the like reaction. It's a pretty scary roller coaster right there. It does. And, you know, some chemical reactions even have multiple transition states, like there might be multiple humps and multiple so activation energies. So there could be like two or three or five thousand humps? Absolutely, you bet. Wow. It that's... all depends on the chemical reaction. Yeah. Now. I know this, you know, if the hump, what if the hump was like really, really big? I mean, that'd take a lot of energy, wouldn't it? That's right. Wouldn't there be a way, like, somehow, if, if the energy is that big, wouldn't mm -hmm. the reaction not go? That's right. So if the activation energy is too high and the reactants can't get over it, the reaction isn't going to happen. Yeah, but, I, but what if, you know, we see one that's too high, mm -hmm. but yet there's like, journals and stuff like it says oh this reaction happens well how do they happen if the energy hump is so high so what they do that's actually a really good point if there's a reaction that you want to happen you know you have some reactants or whatever and you have a desired product you want to make you know this is pretty common in like chemical research and all that like you know making new household cleaners and all that they do this sort of thing mm -hmm. um, you know you have desired reactants a really huge insanely big activation energy in order to reach the products so how do you get over that that's a good question what we do is we use something called a catalyst. A catalyst. A catalyst, that's right. So a catalyst is basically just something that lowers the activation energy, makes the hump smaller, so that way the reaction will proceed faster. So, and we can kind of represent that here on our diagram by saying 
well, why don't we just say that the transition state gets lowered to say about right there? And but it's basically difference. like tunneling through the hill. Pretty much, exactly. Okay. And okay. that's what a catalyst would do. I see that. Okay. Yeah. The most common chemical catalyst for you guys, for your class, is going to be heat. So typically, I mean, this is even obvious, um, when you make things, like, like when you bake a cake, I mean, you have all the ingredients there, you put them together, but it's <coughs> raw batter. It's disgusting looking. So you put it into the oven, you give it a whole bunch of heat, and it cooks, and the chemical reactions take place. The heat is the catalyst. Yeah. And the uh, cake is good, so. Cake batter is also good. I don't know what you think. But... Well, yeah, but raw eggs are actually anyway, good for you. Anyway. Anyway, so that's what a catalyst does. It's going to lower the activation energy. Uh, I, I noticed something about this particular diagram. Yes. The reactants are here and the products are here. It looks like the products, mm -hmm. if this is energy, it looks like the products have a lower energy than the reactants. That's right. The final products have relatively lower energy than the reactants. So what do you think that might mean? Overall, as far as energy goes, what happened to the energy? Well went somewhere, I guess. I mean... That's right. It can't just disappear. It's got to go somewhere. It, the energy went up here, yet it's, like, less here. That's right. So what happened is that the relative energy of the products is lower than that of the reactants, which means that energy overall had to be released. Okay. Okay? So, and that makes sense when you think about it, since energy is going up here, energy, a whole bunch of energy is being gained to get to here, and a whole bunch is released to get down here. Overall, there is a loss of energy, okay? okay? So this energy is lost as heat, and that kind of a chemical reaction is what we call an exothermic. Can you ever have a reaction where the products have a higher energy level than the reactants? Absolutely. So you're saying that maybe oh, really? the products stop right there or something like that? Yeah, something like that. So what happens then is that, again, you have an increase in energy and then a loss. But if you stop right here, if that's where your products stop, it's relatively higher than the reactants, which means that there was an overall gain of energy. So again, that'd be usually a gain of heat, and that would be called an endothermic reaction. Two different reactions we got going on here was the exothermic one, uh -huh. which remember is a loss of energy, okay. which is usually heat, and that kind of makes sense. Like if you were to have an exothermic reaction in the lab and you feel the beaker, the beaker will feel hot because it's losing that heat. Okay, and then the other one was the endothermic, where you have an overall absorption of energy. And since it's absorbing energy, it's going to feel cold in your hand if you have the reaction taking place. So if it's endothermic, does that mean that you'd have to put heat energy into it to make it go? Sometimes you might still have to, because remember, you still have to get over this hump. But the, uh, the exothermic and the endothermic just has to do with the overall energy exchange between the reactants and the products. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so you're just looking at the difference from here to there, as opposed to that gigantic hill. Yeah, so it's really energy from here to here that matters? Pretty much. Okay. Yep. But still remember that activation energy is important if you want the reaction to happen and that you can use catalysts in order to lower that activation energy. And also, since all you guys are, well, most likely all you guys are going to be nurses, um, a, a, a tongue twister going on here, a biological catalyst that you will be most familiar with using, you know, in your future biology classes and all that, is going to be an enzyme. So that's just a note that for, you know, later on, later courses you guys will be taking, the enzymes will be a pretty important catalyst for you guys. Okay, that sounds interesting. Yeah, enzymes are cool. Yes, but that's a different class. Alright. Alright. Well, there we go. Energy diagrams. Good stuff. Yes, it is. Go out there and make some chemical reactions happen. Do it. <laughs> See you later.